texting. Okay. I'm looking at a scripture that came. Yeah, no, no, you're you're absolutely okay. But um, and and it enfolds a new area of prayer, right? Where an an apostolic podcaster can now pray for an anointing and an empowerment in their lives that was never seen before, yeah. that was never seen in ministry or in the church before because of this new avenue of podcasting. And it is, God, help me, enable my mind, give me the spirit of mm. wisdom to unfold, to allow, usher in that spirit of prophetic talk so that it then is reflected on the masses of individuals who will listen and see and understand what does spiritual talk look like? What does spiritual talk feel like? Yeah. How should it minister to my soul? You know, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, mm. but a man of understanding will draw it out. Mm. That's Proverbs twenty and five. Right. That's, That's a exactly what I'm getting to. That's exactly what I. How do you draw from the well? How do you draw it? Out? How do you draw from that treasure of somebody else's spirit, their mind, their ministry? Yeah. Because this really gives an insight to a pri a place of privilege that only family members of preachers, uh, evangelists, and ministers who get invited to the dinner yeah, afterwards. The dinner table, yeah. That's they are the ones who have the privilege of listening to such powerful talk. Yeah. The church doesn't. So That's we're true. actually giving them a view into mm -hmm. what kinds of things do these men of God talk about, right? Yeah. Excluding, of course, the jokes that are inside jokes and they <laughs> laugh, and th which they have as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, I think it's that's why this is becoming important. It's exposing yeah. to apostolic conversation. Yeah, it's, it's I love exposing it. Exposing to apostolic. So it's, it's a uh, the term that the Lord's had in my spirit all year has been apostolic atmospheres, mm -hmm. and everything that I do in ministry right now is with that concept at the forefront of my mind in trying in some way to facilitate what I'm doing into an apostolic atmosphere, whether it be having coffee, podcast, preaching a message, which is mm. an obvious one, um, a one-on-one -on -one phone conversation, whatever it is. And um, it's like little pilot flames, these apostolic mm. atmospheres that okay. people can go to, and they can go there with something it it sets them on fire yeah it, it's a it it catches and it starts in the individual but it grows and develops as a large collective blaze of the glory of god yeah flowing through you know in particular up and down california and that's why i go up and down california is to do everything i can to help and to throw another log on the fire yeah set apostolic atmospheres yeah and that's not meant in the cultural sense, right? It's meant in the true biblical sense. It's spirit flow. Spirit flow. It's an atmosphere. In an atmosphere, you're not just taught things, but you catch things and you pick things up. And their apostolic atmosphere is one of the primary um, purposes is for impartation. Mm. Right. And so I guess there's probably a little... Uh, maybe a, a manifestation of impartation in the cultural Pentecostal sense is just not the kind we're looking for. Right. Um, sometimes you see people and they have kind of a, what my son Charlie calls the veneer. Veneer. The veneer. It's like they have this surfacey Pentecostal thing on them. Yeah. And you, you know that there's some depth and there's some uh, genuine qualities to them. But there's this cultural Pentecostal veneer. You even see it in the tone mm -hmm. of their voice and the mm -hmm. inflections that they mm -hmm. use. They know how to do it. They know how to do it. Yeah. And in an apostolic atmosphere, you can, you get beyond that veneer and you really get into what is the Spirit saying. And you get to a place where there's no... Um, you want to cultivate a place where there's no fear and insecurity and pride and the things that hold us back from just being real mm. in the presence of God because mm. just being real in the presence of God that's where things are are pulled out and placed into our spirits yeah you know? yeah there's there's something about the genuine touch of the spirit that breaks down the veneer it breaks down yeah. the uh the presentation it breaks through 
it yeah. doesn't just make you weep. It makes you snot. Yeah. It doesn't make you just uh, shout hallelujah. It makes you uh, shout until your voice gives out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just make you pray loud. Yeah. It, it tears up your soul and your stomach. And right. it, it tears you up physically and it makes yeah. it almost, it actually is culturally inappropriate. People would say, oh, this guy's crazy, right? But then it's at that point in time where we're actually reaching Pentecost right. because in Pentecost they thought they were drunk. Right. Yeah, that's right. Right? Right. Yeah. So that's, that's the amazing thing about that true mm -hmm. apostolic flow is it, it begins to break these lines, yeah. uh, these, these lines, and even cultural lines that we've developed within the Pentecostal community yeah. that signify on a cultural level that we belong. Mm-hmm. The clothes, the, the shoes, the talk, the inflection, it breaks yeah. through those things. Right. And so one, one scripture I was going through with some students this morning, actually, that I feel is a good indication of what you're talking about, apostolic atmospheres. First uh, Corinthians two thirteen it says, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, mm -hmm. but in which the Holy Spirit teaches. Yeah. The things I'm saying, I didn't learn via observation from some, and man could be a good, godly spiritual person. He said, I learned this because the Holy Spirit taught me this. Mm. But then he, he says this, comparing mm. spiritual, spiritual things with spiritual. spiritual. The word compare, if you look it up in the Greek, it, it has the connotation, and it's the word that we get, it means to synchronize. Mm. So comparing here, he's not talking about taking A and B and looking at one and two and looking at the differences between the two. He's talking about taking a spiritual truth and I'm going to combine that with your spirit man. Yeah, an alignment. And in alignment, we're going to synchronize those things. Yeah. So wow. I didn't come to preach to your carnal mind and add carnal knowledge to your, to your database, yeah. but I'm actually going to add substance to your spirit. Yeah. And so I might not wow you tremendously with the content of my illustrations and and uh, my oratory, but when I leave, I'm going to develop an atmosphere or bring an atmosphere with me that's going to actually add substance to your spirit. Mm -hmm. And and that's the truth. It, the most apostolic messages, at least in my experience, maybe it's different for other people, is if you were to really ask me, you know, what, what was preached tonight, I, I couldn't pinpoint, you know, a, 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 a sharp saying that was said or a, a really quippy illustration. Right. But I know that my spirit has been fed and yeah, had witness. substance has been added to yeah. it. Yeah. And so I, I think that's the crux of apostolic the deep atmosphere. Connecting with deep. Mm. Right. Yeah. It's not necessarily the uni and this kind of ties into what you were talking about that podcaster. It's not necessarily the uniqueness of what's being said. And that's the challenge for young preachers is this this desire to be unique. And yeah. I think that's a development of social media yeah. is everybody's trying original. to go viral. Yeah. They're right. trying to be original. Yeah. They're, they're trying to do something that's going to get likes and shares and clicks right. rather than just aligning yourself with the flow of the spirit, which often is saying things that have been said mm. thousands of times before, mm -hmm. but they're just said in the right flow and the right dimension. And mm -hmm. you really hit on that. It's not about the words that being s yeah. are being said only. It's about the spiritual alignment that yeah. takes place. And so this is the development of an apostolic atmosphere, uh. in my opinion. I'm, I'm not here to tell you things that I've been taught in my carnal mind, good methods mm -hmm. or good best practices. Right. There's nothing essentially wrong with that. But Paul said, when I come, I don't want your faith to be in the wisdom of man. Yes. And, and, that's, and that, I think I've had a misunderstanding of that passage where Paul said, I didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom. And there is a... An, I've always had the understanding, well, enticing words of man's wisdom is ineffective. Well, that's not true. Enticing words of man's wisdom is very effective Persuasive. at building crowds, mm -hmm. at building assemblies. It taps, it taps into the emotional strata, but it doesn't get into the spirit. It'll get you invited. It'll get you invited back. You know, like it'll get you a career as a as a preacher slash mm -hmm. public speaker. But he says your faith yeah. at the end of the day. The reason you came to church and the reason that you live life is based on that man's wisdom. Mm. And so if a better argument will ever come right. into your, your life, your faith is shaken. Your faith is shaken. Ooh. So he says your foundation doesn't need, it's not that I can't, 
or it's not effective. Yeah. I just realized the more effective route mm. is that your faith is in the power of God, yeah, sure. not in a human argument. Right. So thus, I don't have to worry about creating the best argument yes. or having the best oratory skills or having the best unique words. Demonstration to demonstration or unique yeah. presentation. Or the unique, that's a great way of saying it. I'm not worried <laughs> about the unique presentation and persuading you in those ways. I want my persuasion to be based on the atmosphere that you experience, whether it be through miracles, whether it be through that type of worship that is drawn right. out of you. Yeah. But that's where your faith is going mm-hmm. to lie. Yeah, I've, I've told this story a bunch of times, and it's really impacted me. I remember in our youth group, we had just these wonderful touches of God. These, you know, you know, the, what youth groups did we pray all night and demonstrations of the Spirit? And there was a group that left the church and. They lived a completely carnal lifestyle, but they still would keep coming back to church every once in a while. And someone just with boldness asked him one day, why do you guys even stick around? Why don't you just fully go in, live your life how you want to live? Why are you living this half and half life? Yeah. And they said this, because we know what we experienced was real. Mm -hmm. I don't have all the answers. I don't really know how to figure all this out. I just know that my faith wasn't based in enticing words of man's wisdom. Yeah. It was based in the power of God. And so it's adding that spiritual substance. Mm. I think that is definitely under promoted among young ministers. Yeah. Worry about what you're going to add to the congregation in the invisible and what you're not going to get credit for Yeah, rather than uh, maybe some unique things that you might have seen. Yeah. The, um, the desire to be unique. There are a few ingredients to it from what I can see there's an outside impact which you briefly mentioned was the cultural pressure the social media clicks all that there's also the Pentecostal cultural pressure Mm -hmm. which is that um, an example is that I've used recently is that God allows this brass serpent to be looked upon to cure the issues that the children of Israel are having having with these fiery serpents. But over time, that which God intended to be a blessing became something that was worshipped. And in the days of, I think it was Hezekiah, Hezekiah. it was called Nehushtan, which means a brass thing. And so we have a Pentecostal culture full of these objects of worship of things that God intended to promote worship to him. Mm. And one of those examples is preaching. Mm. And so if you can preach in a certain way that Pentecost worships, then you become the God rather than God being the God. Right. And so we have not only an outside cultural deal where the carnality of our culture is just pushing image all the time, but we also have some internal struggles within the church because we want our preachers to be our heroes we want them to be the little g gods that we worship Mm. and so there's a certain idolatry Mm. that has crept into the pentecostal movement and so you have that you have the outside culture you have the inside cultural challenges and then you have the challenges from within which i think god set up that way and that is that in your 20s in particular you're in that first crisis of life and that's going to be the identity crisis you have the identity crisis of the youth you'll have the midlife crisis where you're looking around saying what am i doing what am i accomplishing and then you have mortality crisis which is what have i done what have i done with my life so when you take the outside cultural pressure to push image all image but nothing on the inside and you take the inside cultural pressures that the enemy has kind of crept in among Pentecost and caused us to set, not not just preachers, that was one example, but many things we do are, uh, uh, I think if we're honest, about to the level of where we worship those things yeah. rather than worshiping it's very, God. It's very important. And then you put that in the vulnerable, um, malleable season of a young person's life. Yeah, right. It's a mixture that will produce something that has a veneer on the outside right. that looks good, but on right. the inside it's it's not conducting what God wants it to conduct. It's beautiful. Yeah. I, I want to pass this uh, to something Josh and I were talking about in a private conversation the other day, and you said something really impacted me. So let me 
kind of jog your memory a little bit. It, this reminds me a little bit of what Jesus says concerning the Sabbath. He says, do you not know that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath? Mm-hmm. I, I, I instituted the Sabbath for your benefit, not to hurt you. I wanted you to rest so you can learn to have faith in me mm-hmm. um, so that you wouldn't have to work on the seventh day. And, and people were, they weren't allowing Jesus to heal and do good things on the Sabbath. He said, you don't understand why this was instituted. We were talking a little bit the other day. Oftentimes in our movement, we can be majorly concerned with people who lack reverence. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that's very important. I, th- I don't think we should move that benchmark at all. But sometimes there's a group, you talked about how people will confuse the essence of a tradition. You remember you talking about that? Yes, yes. And they will confuse the essence of a tradition and they will put that essence on the tradition itself. Could you uh, remind me what you said about that? Yeah, so um, the uh, what this is uh, referring to is uh, uh, traditions like uh, like the Sabbath was an example that Jesus gave to give us a, a principle that we can then apply to other things. Another ex- great example was communion. The Apostle Paul dealt with that with the Corinthian church. Mm-hmm. Uh, where they uh, the the tradition is not bad. So first of all, what's important is that I think we should resist the urge of becoming anti-tradition. Right, and we say that often, right? Mm-hmm. And and that in itself has become a cultural marker. We don't follow religion; we follow God. We don't follow tradition; we follow. But we do follow tradition. Mm-hmm. If you really look at what tradition tradition is, uh, we do follow tradition offerings we take offerings okay right. we uh we uh, celebrate a pastor's day or a pastor's month uh, we um we have uh you know we do our service on sundays okay mm-hmm. uh we we have all kinds of traditions um and the point is not giving up the traditions right it's not confusing the practice of the tradition with the essence of what that tradition was What's supposed to be. What right. is it for? Very good. And right. what is that deeper meaning that's supposed to happen? And by deeper meaning, I don't mean how is it metaphorically symbolic to your life. I always mean that apostolic. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean it in its apostolic sense. What is the spiritual reaction that should be occurring in me right. as I participate in the, the, the bread and the wine? Very yeah. good. What should be happening internally in my soul? in my spirit as a result of the Holy Ghost as I practice this tradition of chewing my mouth in unleavened bread and drinking of the fruit of the vine, Mm -hmm. which is physically something traditional that we repeat, but has a spiritual significance. So a tradition is only bad if it's outside of the boundaries of the word. Right. Or if it impedes the flow of the spirit. Exactly. Other than that, traditions are the flexible structure through which spirit flow should come. Absolutely. And so an example of what you're talking about is when I became pastor of one of the churches that I pastored, we did not take communion for a while. Mm. And I may take flack over that, but the reason why we went a little while without taking communion is because communion had been so traditionalized Mm. that what you're saying, the word that you're using is the essence or the spirit of it. Mm-hmm. We have the spirit and the letter is what we're looking at. Mm-hmm. The, 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 we have the physical embodiment of the structure of the tradition. Yep. That would kind of be the letter of the law, yep. if you will. But the spirit of it was being ignored. Yeah. And so in order for me to get communion from this end of the pendulum swing to here. I didn't yeah. want it to go here where we cut off and never do it again right. because as I said last night, the proper response to false doctrine on one end of the spectrum is not false doctrine on the other end of the right. spectrum. It's sound doctrine. Yes. But sometimes in order to get to sound doctrine, you have to tear up the foundations, reteach, relay, all that type of thing. Very good. And so we didn't do communion for some time because there was an atmosphere among the core people in the church that was very much tradition without the spirit of that tradition. They didn't realize, they didn't know why they were doing what Mm -hmm. they were doing. And so I had to rework that and I had to relay that foundation. And we have a lot of that in Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And the cultural 
trend of trying to destroy trans tra uh, traditions one of one of the marks of postmodernism is the dematerialization mm -hmm. or the breaking down of all things institutional deconstructionism mm -hmm. and so we see that deconstructionism is is just running wild in the world and if we're not careful it can get out of balance in the church and so organizations are not bad mm -hmm. right they're, but they're only good if they're according to the word and they facilitate the flow of the spirit yes and so we're not anti-organization right we just don't want it to be here or here we and want it, doesn't it to replace. be right here that's what was dealt with on uh what is it wednesday morning pastor haney talking about right apostolic yeah. and position sometimes position and apostolic <laughs> ministry align yeah. but that one is a district superintendent that one is a presbyter that one has some type of leadership position does not equal the essence of apostolic ministry right and uh right. and that's what we it's have it's a to structure understand. intended to facilitate yes. apostolic ministry yes right right hopefully we would vote in the people who already hold those positions right. in the spirit yeah not try to superimpose them yeah and this is politicizing takes place yeah right take men that already demonstrate an, apost an apostle's anointing yeah. or even just a bishop's anointing and and yeah. we we as a brethren okay we feel this touch of god on this person's life rather than this is my guy this is my friend Let's get enough votes. That's where the system right. crumbles. Yeah. Well, if we don't vote in people who are spiritual, what we have to realize is that we are submitting to people who are not spiritual if we vote them in. Mm -hmm. And God uh, requires it to an extent. Mm -hmm. And so binding and loosing in the context, in the direct context of the New Testament church had to do with the institutional of a lot of these early church practices that God gave the, those apostles the authority to set up certain structures mm -hmm. in order to facilitate the movement of the Spirit in the earth in those times. Yeah. Wow. And so a modern manifestation of binding and loosing in the church uh, in part would be our voting system when apostolic ministry with apostolic authority says, okay, this seems good to us and to the Holy Ghost. It's not outside the Word. It's not intended to become tradition right. to the point where we don't understand the essence of it. We're yeah. not trying to replace structure, but because of our modern context, we need this to help to implement apostolic authority structure. Right. And so we we bind or loose, we implement or de-implement certain right. practices in the church. Well, when we implement voting systems and we vote carnal people into that, mm -hmm. we are still held to that system mm -hmm. because it's, it's been implemented. It's true. And so we're submitted to that system. And so part of the issues that we have in the modern apostolic movement, you name the organization, the yeah. alphabet soup. It's mm -hmm. not just UPC or WPF yeah. or right. whatever it is. The issue that we struggle with organizationally is that the apostolic authority has implemented the system, but then there's been non-spirit-led decision-making that votes carnal leaders in, Very and we're bound to that. Right. And so we bump our head on that, and there cannot be full spirit flow. Yeah. And so what has to happen is through the wisdom of the Spirit, and it's a surgical procedure of the Holy Ghost, yeah. we have to come in and we have to spend our time deconstructing these things and untying these knots that we've tied. Mm -hmm. Because There's nothing wrong with the system. Mm -hmm. The issue is, just like a computer, what you put into the system right. is what you're going to get out of the system. Yeah, and so we're going to need to see very not important. a de construction of organization mm -hmm. we're not trying to do away with institutions we're not trying to move from 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 it being pure traditions of men to utter anarchy and lawlessness because right. that's the spirit of iniquity that's yes. the spirit of the yes. age but we have to find an apostolic <clears throat> balance and right now what god has as a primary theme in the church is fivefold ministry why is that it's because he's trying to get our systems that have been implemented in the will of God. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get them from this end, not over here, but right here. He's trying to get sound doctrine so that those systems can function yeah. 
to the place that we can handle the harvest that God is sending into the church okay, because we need organization to handle the harvest. Right. One guy out here by himself and another guy out here by prophets in all when all the prophets are in caves, they all think they're the only one left. Right. But when they come together, there's a confluence mm. and there's a synergistic effect of their anointing that comes together and it's the same way in an organization we can't just have this church this church this church and they kind of generally know in their mind that they all exist but when there's a working together yeah and and there can be a spirit flow conducted right. that's when we're able to handle right yeah. i don't think that i don't think that's a, a stated enough i don't think that could be overstated so many people with organization take the all or nothing approach right either it is the semblance of the fivefold ministry yeah. or throw right. out in the garbage it's right. it's one or the other right but you talked about it last night, and maybe the Lord will lead you to talk about it now, is that downward authority structure. Yeah. You don't have to necessarily be an apostle mm -hmm. or my pastor for me to go through a, a chain of authority. Even in the life of a Christian believer, we're commanded to submit to the government. They're, they're not the fivefold ministry. Right. Servants are commanded yeah. to submit to their employers. Right, right even whether they're godly or not, mm -hmm. submit to them. And if somebody holds a card in a particular organization, well, it might not be an apostle, but in holding a card to that particular organization, you are saying, I'm going to bring myself in some type of alignment with this fellowship, whether you have, you might not have the authority of apostle over my life or the authority of uh, as my pastor, but as me being a member of this group, it's not and all or nothing, it's right. like you said, it's somewhere, yeah. mm -hmm. balance, understanding yeah. what it is, yeah. and lining up. So when you sign your name on that piece of paper and say that I want to hold a card with this organization, you are biblically submitting yourselves one to another. Right. That's right. And so whether we like it or not, there are certain elements that we don't agree with organizationally that will happen that we're going to have to be led by the Holy Ghost and learn how to navigate without having a critical spirit of rebellious that's attitude. That's right. Super important. That's wisdom. And, and that's, that's, what's, that's what's unattractive and that's what's boring. Uh, and I, however, I would venture to say both the, uh, the keeping of the system as it is uh, without the essence of apostolic ministry integrated is the wisdom of man right. and the desire to destroy the system is the wisdom of man yeah both of them are the wisdom of man that cannot produce the, the way yeah. of the spirit the way of the spirit is in integration it's wisdom it's both yeah we call it the middle of the road but i i just call it right thinking yeah right sound doctrine, sound doctrine. right doctrine. thinking let's let's get a biblical story to support this the apostle paul comes to james and he said and and he makes an argument for how he is not speaking against the law mm-hmm He's not speaking against the laws as if it were something evil. No, he says the law is good. The law is spiritual. But there were people who blamed him. There were people who accused him. So James tells him, look, um, we approve your teaching. We here in Jerusalem, we know you're a man of God. However, to appease those who judge you, why don't you take a vow? And he takes a vow. The Apostle Paul takes wow. a vow with two other people and shaves his head according to the law. Where? at the temple, which is a system, a man system, mm -hmm. that at that point in time is corrupt because first of all, the Sanhedrin rejected Jesus Christ. They killed Stephen. And yet he is taking a vow under it, within a building that is managed by a system that is carnal. Uh, however, it is an avenue through which to do something apostolic, cultivating unity amongst the brethren and showing you I am not your enemy. Right. We are together. Incredible right? insight. It is that in itself gives us permission to do such things. Mm -hmm. Timothy having to be circumcised just to enter in the synagogue. Right. Uh, that is apostolic. Yeah. A and wow. and it's not giving up one thing or another. Mm -hmm. It's understanding that many times these are ve vehicles through uh, through which apostolic ministry can flow through. Yeah. Well, you have to find where the flow is. And the flow is always going to be in the same place. Mm. It's always going to be in God's structure of authority. It's not going to be outside of God's structure of authority. Okay. So sometimes we kind of warp that structure of authority if we're not careful. But we're required 
to submit in certain ways to Mm -hmm. a little bit of a crooked structure warped by humanity because that's what God's flow is coming Mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're going to have to understand in the church, if we're going to push themes like fivefold ministry, gifts of the Spirit, is that these things only are meant to function and flow and operate through the authority structure of the kingdom of God, Mm -hmm. apostolic authority. Mm -hmm. And so in the church today, we have a strong understanding of authority uh, in part, but it's partial right now. And we also have an understanding of submission in part, but we need a, a, a greater understanding of submission. So look at it like a cross, okay? We have an understanding of authority structure upward. We all know who our authority is. We know the right response to that authority, how to submit ourselves to that authority. Um, I would even go a step further and say that we need to go beyond submission in the apostolic church. We need to get to unity and agreement Mm -hmm. because submission is only activated when there's disagreement. It's when there's two missions and you Mm -hmm. sub-mission. You Mm -hmm. put one under the other. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we understand that upward, but what I mentioned last night is sometimes we ignore it downward. Yeah. And the example that I used was that if there is a woman in the church and her husband is in the church that I pastor, I am their pastoral authority, but there is an authority in their home. Right. I'm the pastoral covering over their home, but when I interact with what's going on in their home, I'm going to go downward through that authority structure, and that man is the head of that home. And that woman is under the covering of that man in the home, and those children are under the covering of mom and dad in the home. So if I'm having trouble with their kids in the church, I'm not going to mom because she's not the head of that home. Right. I'm, going to, I'm not going directly to the kids because it's not my role to go directly to those kids. That downward flow of correction must flow through that authority structure. Yeah. And so I will go to the head of that home and say, hey, we're having some issues with your kids in Sunday school. You and your wife get together and talk about it. They're just kids. Mm-hmm. God bless them. I know that you're anointed mm-hmm. to take care of them. Well, what that produces in mom and dad is it produces an appreciation for me because not only am I telling them that I am authority upward in your life, yeah. but I recognize that you are also authority and the authority structure goes downward, right. and that, in fact, builds their trust in me as the covering of their home. Yeah. And so that's the upward-downward aspect of the authority structure envisioning it as a cross. The, the horizontal is what we leave out concerning submission. And so it talks about seven times in the New Testament, the English is the word submit. And seven times it's followed by the exact same word, yourselves. Mm. And so it's telling us that there's a personal responsibility to submission, to submit. And that's one thing that we're going to need to revisit in this generation is the personal responsibility. Deny yourselves. Submit yourselves. Examine yourselves. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And so there's a personal responsibility for me to submit myself, not only to the upward authority structure, Mm. but also it says submit yourselves one to another. Yeah. And so there's a one to another submission. My wife is submitted to me because I'm the head of the home, but she also knows where I am right now. Yeah. Because I'm submitting myself to her in those areas. That doesn't mean that she's my head or she's my authority. What that means is that in a healthy relationship, you have this submission, but you also have this horizontal lateral submission. And so in the apostolic movement, if we're going to get gifts of the Spirit right, Right. we're going to have to have upward submission, recognize the authority structure downward, and have a lateral submission. If we're going to get fivefold ministry proper, we're going to have to understand authority upward the, up the chain of apostolic authority, yeah. downward into the home, and side to side between brethren. Yeah. Because if we don't understand all four points of, of that structure, 
It's then that the gifts get out of control. You have things like happening in the Corinthian church. You have rebellion in the church. You have Mm -hmm. divisions in Mm -hmm. the church and those types of things. So just simple, basic teaching on those things are going to be vital moving forward to help us get these big themes in their proper place. And uh, this is the thing. When we are submitting one to another, it's not necessarily that I'm submitting to you. Uh, although it looks that way, I'm actually submitting to the way that Christ is manifesting himself through you. Mm-hmm. I'm, manis- manifest- uh, I'm submitting to Christ because we're the body. <laughs> uh, sometimes the body has to submit to each other and to gain access to the way that God has chosen to distribute his gift through you to the church. I need to lend my will to you and say, I receive. I receive what you have and the way that God is anointing you in his ministry to minister to the body there must be that horizontal submission right. to a- gain access to all that Christ is actually trying to do within the body right and and many times and this is this is the thing uh, many times we as more experienced ministers have to realize that even though there are younger uh people who are just starting to gain their sensitivity of the way that God wants to move through them in the body, uh, we cannot write off their naiveness as it not being Christ. And I'll give you an example. Um, I have submitted myself to young Bible college students who come up to me and say, God has just moved on me to pray for you. Yeah. Um, And many times because of their beginning uh, to understand the voice of God, their prayers are unclear. Mm -hmm. They're not precise. Yet it would be wrong of me to assume that Christ is not trying to move on my life through them, even though they're they're at a different place of maturity and understanding. And many times I'll draw, I, I say it this way, and I'm not trying to deify them, but I draw Christ out of them. Mm-hmm. I draw what God is trying to do out of them, and I ask them before. Sometimes they'll begin praying. I'll stop them. I'll say, what do you feel to pray about? And I'll ask them, what has God placed in your spirit? Yeah. You're, well, you're this helping is them his... to mature in exactly. their understanding. Knowing that I am not ministering to myself, I'm trying to get what God is trying to get to me through them. Yeah. And they'll say, well, this and that. And I help them gain accuracy, and I say, Pray for me, I receive it, and I lift my hands, right. and I get a blessing from the Lord. Right. But it's still Christ through them, even yeah. though they haven't attuned their ears to the Spirit to the point of clarity. You mm-hmm. know, And I didn't give them that clarity. I drew it out of them, and God yeah. gave them that clarity. That's a beautiful picture of, of, of the entire system working properly, because as an authority, you're teaching them in that moment. But as a fellow member of the body... Right. You're submitting to what God is doing exactly. through them in that moment. Exactly. I'm just teaching them how to take, in essence, I'm teaching them how to take authority over me. Right. And me submitting to them. Right. I'm teaching them how to be a spiritual, a true spiritual authority. Yeah. And this will not continue after this prayer, yeah. but it is a temporary me submitting to what God wants to give yeah. me through them. One of the one of the priorities of New Testament scripture has to do with communication between brethren and brothers and sisters. And one of the reasons for that is to properly conduct this lateral submission structure that God has set in the church. And so last night at CLC, I taught on the laying on of hands, Mm. and I explained it or tried to explain it according to the authority structure that God had set up. And the example that I used was I would not, and nobody in the building has the authority to go lay their hands on Pastor Nathaniel Laney because he's at the, he's the head, he's the visible head, the visible representative mm-hmm. of the headship of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. in this local church. And so the laying on of hands flows down that authority structure. And as a guest minister in the local church, I do have the authority given to me by him Mm -hmm. through the invitation to lay my hand on the heads of those who are in the congregation. And so there's that vertical authority structure that gives clarity to that doctrine of laying on of hands. But then after service, a young lady came up to me, and there were so many really good questions 
uh, that I was prompted uh, with after service by some of the students and the young people. And she asked me the question. She said, well, what if it's a peer? What do I do? And I said, well, what I would advise you to do is make sure there's good communication between the two of you and use wisdom. If Brother Morgan Ellis and I are praying for one another and I feel to lay my hand on him and he is my peer, I'd say, Brother Morgan, I love you and I just feel to pray for you. Would you mind if I laid my hand on your head and pray for you? Mm -hmm. And so that's not me taking authority over my brother, Mm -hmm. but that is me being used in the way that I feel God wants me to be used. But I'm submitting to his will. Mm -hmm. He's submitting to how God is using me. Yes. And so there's a mutual submission. Yes. Another girl asked the question, what if I'm standing in the sanctuary and the preachers say, turn and lay your hand on somebody's head? What do I do in that situation? I said, well, you know, for example, if you're standing next to uh, an elder ministry lady, maybe a pastor's wife who's Mm -hmm. 55 years old and you're a student at Christian Life College, you wouldn't immediately just slap your hand on that lady's forehead, but you would speak to her and you would say, sister, I don't fully feel comfortable laying my hand on your head because you're my elder. Mm Mm-hmm. But would you mind laying your hand on my head and praying yes, for me? Appropriate. And then that lady in grace is likely going to say, would you lay your hand on my head yes. and pray for me? Well, yes. what she's doing is she's recognizing that you have submitted to the authority structure. Mm-hmm. And so she is now submitting to one, herself one to another. And beyond that, I I would be very careful in the pulpit to really tell people to do that in mm-hmm. a public setting, primarily because, not because it's wrong, but because within the body right now, we don't have a full understanding yet of the authority structure right. and of the doctrine of the laying yeah. out of hands. Right. And so this is why we're going to have to, along with these big themes that the Spirit is pushing, apostolic ministry, gifts of the Spirit, fivefold ministry, We're going to have to teach at a granular level how authority works, and we're going to have to teach literally how these doctrines work according to the Scripture, according to the Bible, so that we don't lose that essence that you're talking about, and these just become traditionalized things that we do. Well, I mean, in reality, ignorance restricts us from access to uh, the true liberties that God has given us to operate in in the kingdom. And uh, and we have to wait for a revelation to catch up with the rights that God has made uh, potentially available to us. Mm-hmm. A a simple example of this, for, for example, revelation has to catch up with the rights that we've been granted. Yes, That's good. exactly. So, uh, for example, I if I'm a minister, this has happened before, right? If I go to another church, if I'm in a conference, or if I uh, I go I go preach to a new church where that mm-hmm. pastor is not really familiar with me. I'm careful not to immediately start laying hands on the congregation. I'm careful because though uh, though the people in the congregation might even know who I am, yeah. the authority, spiritual authorities don't know me. Mm-hmm. And if you're in a brand new context, exactly in a brand new context, you're using wisdom, right? They're ignorant of the gift that God has placed in yeah. me and the ministry that God has placed in me. Yeah, I feel confidence right. in my church, but you're waiting on hands. that trust to develop exactly. between you and the, the pastor. Exactly. The so they need a revelation of my spiritual identity and I need to be right. asked, come up right. and help. Yeah. And when I'm asked, come up, hey, brother, you're a minister. Come and help me pray. Mm-hmm. Now I'm released. Yeah. And now I can lay hands on that particular congregation. They, in an essence, were ignorant of my me yeah. and my identity in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Their understanding, revelation of how God is moving through me and who I am in the kingdom needed to catch up. Mm-hmm. And until then, uh, their people did not have access to the ministry that resided within me until I was released. Yeah by that spiritual authority. Also, your anointing in that setting is only going to flow through them. Right. It's not going to flow outside of that. Right. So if you don't know yet or you don't have confirmation that there's alignment 
then you're not released yet. Yeah. And um, let me speak to this for just a second because I know there will be younger ministers that watch uh, this podcast. Mm -hmm. And many of them are going in to preach at churches. Mm. And so what does this look like? What is the picture of submission and why do we submit to the local church pastor as a guest minister when we walk in? Now, I'll just say that there will be times when you will preach places where you walk in a higher dimension of spiritual authority than the local church pastor. Mm. That being said, while you're in that setting, you're there under their authority because they are the local church pastor of that congregation. An example would be that Pastor Haney has an apostolic. He has an, and when I say apostolic, I mean specifically the anointing of the apostle. He has that anointing in regions of the world, probably worldwide if we want to describe it. That being said, when he walks into Kerman mm. to preach, though he has that worldwide authority in that local setting, he must align himself to the authority structure that God has ordained in that local church and come in there under my authority. And there's a spiritual reason for this. It's because, theoretically and hopefully, that pastor in that local church has been made known to the spirit world, meaning the spirit world is not like Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? But the spirit world knows who that pastor is, and that pastor walks in dominion, apostolic authority in that area. And so when that young minister comes in, he should submit under the authority of that pastor's covering because if he doesn't, those spirits, he's going to have to contend with those spirits. But if he's under the covering of that local church pastor and that mm -hmm. pastor's been contending with those spirits, then he gains all the victories in battle yes. and all of the okay. years of prayer mm -hmm. And so he's able to step up in the pulpit he without, it, yeah. he inherits it, and that anointing flows downward. Wow. And so no matter who you are, when you go into a local church, you need to come under the covering of that pastor. Now, there are times when I preach in local congregations that that spirit world was not aware that he was an authority because mm -hmm. he hadn't been praying, he right. hadn't been fasting. Those are not times when I have the right to get out of authority. Yeah. I just am locked up. You just can't, you just can't go beyond that. Yeah. You just bump your head, and you may shake the dust off your feet and say, right. "I'm not coming back unless right. they exhibit that they're going to right. make some sort of forward movement in the spirit." And so there have been times when I preached in churches, and I was bumping my head on that pastor's covering the whole time because he wasn't doing what he needed to do. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm, that in mm -hmm. and of itself did not give me the right to get out of, from under that covering. So let, let me take it this direction because this segues in exactly what I was attempting to get at when I sent you those scriptures mm -hmm. of being stewards of the mysteries of God. <coughs> in this case, that you are under, you're going to preach at a church. Yeah. You gain insight of the spiritual status. You, you bump heads with the pastor mm -hmm. and there's only so far that you could go. Mm -hmm. You still don't have the right to call out what you feel in the spirit about the pastor to the congregation. Not, in, then, not to the congregation, yeah. but you do have the option in private because by God sending you in, it is to help lead that pastor nearer to him. Yeah. And so you never disrespect or dishonor mm -hmm. the pastor or, or taint his leadership in the eyes of the people unless it's just some very outside-of-the-box situation mm -hmm. and there's rank sin happening, you know, Eli's sons committing fornication in the yeah. tabernacle yeah. steps or something. Right. But in private, if you have apostolic authority and there's a man who needs correction, perfection, direction, and you may not... Uh, you. You may not be his pastor, but you walk in apostolic authority. There is a, a correction that could take place in private, but mm -hmm. it should not ever be in a public setting, yeah. such as not to disrupt God's authority. Right. And even private correction must be in God's authority structure. Yeah. But sometimes in private, 
you're his authority, yeah. but in public, you're under his authority. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, this relationship can be seen in between David and Saul. Yeah. And David and Saul, where David still re, uh, he recognizes Saul's position and authority and mm -hmm. would not undermine the public to him. Yeah. Even though in private he had some <coughs> some abilities to reveal things and um yeah, okay, so um Well an example would be, let me interject, is my pastor preached for me Sunday. Okay. And so when he was in the pulpit he was under my covering. Mm. But the whole time I was still under his covering. And when I got out of the pulpit, so he didn't correct me or try to perfect me in the pulpit. He built up my leadership and, yeah. and what God had done. Well, outside of the pulpit, he had every right or every option to correct or direct or mm. perfect. Mm -hmm. And he honored that. Yeah. And that's why I trust him as my pastor. Yeah. Now, let's add another dynamic here, uh, the dynamic of the prophetic Mm -hmm. uh, because many times when a young minister has that touch of the prophetic, they're given access to see things, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Mm -hmm. They're given access to speak things that many times within the authority structure are out of their time and out of their season of being able to declare mm -hmm. and being able to institute. In essence, they're feeling things in the Spirit that's supposed to provoke them to intercede, to pray, to search the scripture, and are flashes of the future of where God is taking them, mm -hmm. yet to take that destiny that God has set before them and try to integrate it in full in the present would be out of order mm -hmm. because they are not in the season to be able to say such things, mm -hmm. right? Um, it... it I think it's important for us to learn, and I'm including myself as well, because I, I feel I made those mistakes, mm -hmm. especially before I learned uh, uh, fully uh, how to steward that which God is telling me, and that which God is moving on me, right? You see this in young preachers, right, who, let's say they come right out of Bible college, and they talk about revival, mm -hmm. and they say, you have to take dominion over this city, right? Mm -hmm. You have to take dominion over. And they are speaking things that they have felt in their spirit, mm -hmm. but they had not been granted authority to speak in such a way. Have you ever taken authority over dominion and paid the price to take dominion over a city? Well, if you haven't, then there might be some seasoning that needs to happen in your spirit. Even though you feel the burden of such a thing, mm -hmm. you feel the potential of because faith yeah. sees the unseen, you know? Yeah, this is a very um, interesting topic because, first of all, there's a difference between a prophetic ministry and a prophet. Mm. And we have to recognize that all fivefold ministry is prophetic ministry. Um, the spirit of prophecy can come on any believer. Mm. There's a pro the church is a prophetic community, so there's a prophetic nature to any Holy Ghost-filled believer. There's an increased prophetic nature to any part of the fivefold ministry because uh, conceptually they should be praying and fasting and tapping in in the spirit, and uh, the Holy Ghost is a prophetic spirit. And then there are prophets. And you know the difference when you see a prophet and when you see a prophetic ministry. Mm. Um, a prophet is granted by the Spirit certain liberties, but it's not accessed and it doesn't flow through his humanity. So for an example, is Elder J.J. Bourne is 81 years old. And he told me the first time that God used him as a prophet. He was young. He was like nine, something like that. And he's told the story publicly, so I'll tell it here. And he said that essentially there was a preacher in town that came to visit the house. And his parents were good saints in the church. And that preacher was visiting while Brother Bourne was hiding behind the couch. He's a little boy. 
and he knew that if he got caught hiding behind the couch while mom and dad and the preacher are having a having fellowship and having a meeting, he was going to get the switch. He was going to get a whooping. So for a couple hours, he said, this preacher just tells them things that he knew as a prophet at nine years old or whatever he was. He knew that this preacher was operating in a spirit, but it wasn't the Holy Ghost. Mm. He was being guided to try to seduce and corrupt Brother Born's parents. And God makes this little boy to know this, Mm. and he listens to it. And so the preacher leaves. Mom and dad have essentially embraced the preacher, opened their their spirits up to what he had to say, and Brother Born comes out from behind the couch. Well, Mom gets mad and says, you were behind that couch. You were out of line. I'm going to go out and get a switch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whoop you. And he said, okay, Mama, you can whoop me, but before you do, thus saith the Lord. Hmm. And he begins to prophesy, and it was a 50-year prophecy. For the next 50 years, this is going to be what happens in this family and on, in you and Daddy's life. And the spirit of prophecy came upon that little boy, and the spirit of prophecy brought a certain corrective judgment to his parents through that little boy. That's a prophet. Wow. Yeah. That's not a prophetic voice. Mm. That's a prophet. Yeah. There was a clear delineation in that atmosphere. Anybody who was listening would have known, this isn't a nine-year-old boy speaking. Mm-hmm. This is the Holy Ghost. Yeah. That's the man of God coming out of, uh, uh, coming into the temple and saying, there's going to be a child born, a son by name is going to be, be yes. Josiah. He's yeah. calling it by name 340 years before. Right. That's a prophet yeah. that comes in, and you know it's the Holy yeah. Ghost He becomes speaking. another man. He becomes, becomes another, another man, man. Mm-hmm. right. And so that's the difference between a prophet and a prophetic voice. Now, our young ministries rising up, all of them have prophetic voices in some tone, texture, way, shape, or form. And so they have to implement wisdom along with that. Mm -hmm. And there are some areas where uh, they need to stay away from for a little while until maybe they've walked those roads. Like, for example, I've kind of tuned up some of our young preachers of late because they're single and they're running around preaching about uh, God wants to deliver their generation from pornography. Mm -hmm. Not understanding, out of ignorance, it wasn't malicious, but Mm -hmm. I said, hey, listen, you're— if 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 you're under my covering, you're single, you're not going and you're not calling out pornography. Mm-hmm. And here's why. Yeah. Because you're stirring that spirit up. And I've done this long enough to know that that spirit comes around and retaliates against you on Monday. Mm-hmm. Well, you're single. You have a cell phone. You've just stirred something up that you're not cultivated enough, enough or mature enough in right. ministry. And you don't have a marriage and the safeguards and the years you don't have what it takes to battle with that retaliation, that spirit. And so if anyone's going to call that spirit out, I'm going to call that spirit mm-hmm. out. Or someone who's more uh, mature in those areas, but not someone who's wide open to that primary attack in, in that way. Yeah. And so that would be an example of using wisdom um, in those ways. But then as ministry, we have to recognize and we have to be okay with the fact that sometimes a young man's going to speak and he's going to say something that he's never walked. Mm -hmm. But it's not just him giving an idea. It's the Word of God speaking. Right, right. You know, and so we had it happen Mm -hmm. recently in our church. A 17-year-old boy stood up to the pulpit and he gave a word of prophecy. It wasn't a 17-year-old boy speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. It was the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And when the Holy Ghost began to speak, there was no question about, yeah. is he mature enough to say this? No, no, no. no right. God just yeah. spoke. Excellent. And so if we can understand those things, yeah. I think it helps us to, to have wisdom as ministry, but also receive the Word of God through young people yeah. when they're in a young age. Excellent. It's rightly dividing. This is exactly what, what, uh, what I feel is being done. It's rightly dividing the Word of God, in, in a young generation that's greatly desiring to be used of God. Yeah. And in many uh, ways, God is excelling. He yeah. is ec- uh, accelerating uh, ministry involvement, ministry activity, supernatural activity, 
-hmm. within the young generation and with that comes the need of right the seasoned word the seasoned wisdom to steward the heavy acceleration of the call of god right there's there's an acceleration of revelation yeah and as with paul he had to have humility to accompany his revelations Mm. and so with these young people who are carrying the weight of this rapid acceleration of revelation there's an increased need for humility through fasting Mm. and through humbling themselves Mm -hmm. and we need a revival of anything among the younger generation it's not of gifting of talent of revelation god's doing all that Wow. It's a revival of humility. Right. Yeah, well, good. there's a huge difference between preaching um, off mm-hmm. of spiritual principle and things you've heard other great men of God say, monkey see, monkey do kind of kind of yeah. nature, and speaking a prophetic utterance. We have to understand that when someone's That's speaking good. a word of pro- speaking a word of prophecy, they are just merely the vessel. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to be careful to not over critique the vessel that they need to have lived everything that they say because that puts all of us in a box because right um i can preach deliverance to a drug addict yeah Yeah. never i've never walked the line of being delivered by drugs but the holy spirit empowers me to say things i don't know and not know no is twofold there's there's knowledge words that enter into my mind um just simply grammatically, and then there's knowing via experience. Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit prophetically enables me in both dimensions. Uh, we've all experienced things that come into our minds of things that we did not know. We didn't know those compilation of words before. But also the Holy Spirit will empower me to say things that I have not walked through. Mm-hmm. Right. Deliverance for a, a woman I've never— I'm yeah, telling God, you know, how am I supposed to deliver? Yeah. You know, if it's all ex- through, if it's all experience, through. that cuts right. off exactly. about ninety nine yeah. percent of right. the people You're to right. me, and yeah. it's a spirit of prophecy. You're and right. we yeah. we were we were diving in this recently. You know, it's that promise of of Joel that your sons and your daughters yeah. shall prophesy. Right, and yeah. um, you were telling me stories about your all of your children. You've you've experienced. I've I've experienced that with my children where. Yeah. As of late, I was struggling. Uh, I was I was out and I was struggling to preach a word. It was a morning and a night service, the evening service, and I brought my daughter with me, and she's off in her corner doing her own thing, and I just start praying out loud, Lord, what do you want to tell these people? And I had a message I was struggling with. This is the yeah. word you want, mm-hmm. yeah. and God intentionally let me struggle with it because He wanted to demonstrate. Right. Because at this point, I, I felt like almost always I have clarity, <laughs> but this time I didn't. Right. I didn't know if that was the right word. Yeah. I'm struggling. I pray out loud. Oh, God, what do you want to say to these people? And my daughter has been around me preaching hundreds of times. She's never said anything. She speaks up and says, Dad, I think you need to preach on this, 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 and this. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the Holy I Ghost. love it. What I was feeling yeah. to yes. preach on. Yeah. She prophesied to me without knowing. My, my, and my, then my, I my. said, all right, honey, I hear what you're saying. Dang. Mm. <laughs> and then she, mm. I mean, in the spirit. Because Brother Mark Morgan was talking about, this is where I really was impacted. Yeah. Because Mark Morgan was talking about, if you're going to prophesy, you have to see it before you hear it. Mm. With unbeknownst to me, I have the picture on my phone. <clears throat> While I'm preparing and praying, mm. she draws a picture no. of what's going to happen in that service tonight. Oh, wait. <laughs> and she has text box coming out of my mouth. <laughs> my God. Thank you. Saying dude. exactly yeah. what I was meditating upon oh the yeah. preach oh some my. of it's word for word she's oh in that my, apostolic my, atmosphere yeah and i'm not oh my, my, i'm not on this to promote yeah. you know Adam to be a proud dad yeah. but yeah, yeah. but yeah. Mouth of babes, my, right? my my daughter's never <laughs> preached before yeah and she doesn't yeah. know the experience but because it wasn't yeah. spiritual she wasn't sitting there as an elder mm. saying right. well in my experience dad i think you ought yeah. to preach on this because right. i've been in your scenario right. Right. she's not qualified for that yeah. right. she's not qualified to mentor me on right. preaching yeah. but she is qualified because she's got the holy ghost yeah. to prophesy to me so how do you how do you function when your kid starts working like that you be a good dad and you recognize that god's using them but if they get out of line i'll still correct them but i'm going to give them enough space to grow mm. and so what we need is we don't need rules for these young men and mm. you can say this you know right. we need good elders yes and so for example we have stuff that happens in kerman sometimes i i have i get young preachers come preach because the lord's put a passion in my heart 
for the cultivation, the training up, and the sending out of apostolic ministries. And so we have many young preachers coming up in our church right now. And I also have the belief that the apostolic pulpit should be an unfettered pulpit. Right. And so I have to balance those. Now, I am the elder by authority in that, in that context in the local yeah. church. And so I've had young men say things that maybe they shouldn't have said. Well, I don't let the church know that I'm dissatisfied right. with that while they say it, right. unless it's something just crazy. But yeah. we, don't, we haven't had that because I'm not just going to put them in the pulpit if they're so green that they can't carry the mail at least a little bit. <laughs> right, right, right. And so, but then what I'll do is I'll, I won't even correct them the next day because I know they already know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things are self-correcting and the Holy Ghost corrects us. The amen of the spirit. Yeah. You know, and they already know. And most of the time they'll come to me and say, pastor, did I, did I say, I said, well, you could have maybe done it a different way. And so it's not a hard correction. It's a gentle correction. We had a young man preach a long time one night. Well, I have an unfettered pulpit, and so if that boy's going to go an hour and 40 minutes, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to let him go an hour and 40 minutes. Now, I know this goes against the philosophy of a lot of places, but I'm not trying to raise up Pentecostal preachers. I'm trying to raise up prophets and apostles Mm -hmm. and prophetic voices. And so I'm going to let him face plant, Mm -hmm. and then I'm going to help pick him up, and I'm going to do it in private. Well, I never said a word to him about it. He didn't go an hour 40, but I never said a word to him about it because what happened is he beat himself up over it. Uh, Other people in the church commented, and when they commented, I said, you know what? Mm. You need to get used to long preaching because every once in a while that's the will of God. And I didn't allow them to beat that young man up. But that's something that in the local setting, and I'm not advocating young guys preaching forever because they usually shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But I know the young man's ministry, in an hour and 19 minutes in, he might have prophesied to those people, and somebody's life might have been changed. It's very important. And so as an elder in that context, I'm going to let those young men grow organically in that field. And if it gets a little off, a little wild, I'll do some private pruning, or I'll do a little bit there. But our philosophy is it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Right. And I don't think we ought to take that so far out of the boundaries that we have just have things running wild. But mm-hmm. I'm very comfortable as a leader. I don't have an issue if somebody messes up in the pulpit. Yeah. The people trust me in the pulpit. Yeah. They know the doctrine. I teach the word. They have a, They have a very mature understanding of what's going on. And so I think that there's more room and leeway for young men to maybe drop the ball than sometimes we give them. Mm. And if we're not careful and we just overly correct all the time, then what it does is it causes them to become clones Mm -hmm. and have some of this Pentecostal veneer stuff Mm -hmm. that we talked about. So I fully know that what I just said probably wouldn't be agreed with by by, by a lot of uh, ministries and especially elder ministers because they've had to deal with issues over the years, but that's kind of been the approach that we've taken. Now now let me take this a new direction, and this is a big one here. We need, you are absolutely right, we need elders to be there to release or give a space where apostolic ministry can go forth, mm-hmm. even in the midst of, uh, even in the midst of the weaknesses or the lack of maturity of certain young ministers, let's re- let's introduce that principle now to the system of uh, of an organization. I feel we have done a disservice to ourselves and to the ministry of elders because I feel like the system has imposed limits on an elder's access to release Mm -hmm. a service into apostolic ministry. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Uh, I have been in organizational youth rallies, conferences, conventions, where the anointing is in the room. Mm -hmm. The music minister is in the spirit. 
they're ministering in the spirit and the MC gets up and I would not doubt that because that MC is apostolic they know something is here mm -hmm. and it can be released if uh, I had the liberty to do so the MC at that particular rally is wise to not usurp and to just mm -hmm. say, run the set back again. Let's keep praying. What they need is an elder to come to them and say, do you feel that? Yeah. Do it. They need a leader who is their elder, who is an authority in that, mm -hmm. in that conference, in that youth rally to yeah. say, you yeah. as an MC, I know you feel this. I give you liberty, mm -hmm. take an extra five, 10 minutes and just let them release them. I think program has in, in some ways distanced ourselves from the voice of an elder to be able to even take the mic mm -hmm. and say, stop the program. God is here. You know, we are uh, doing away with a certain announcement that mm -hmm. was supposed to happen in this rally. Yeah. And, and we need to cultivate that organic yeah. apostolic atmosphere allow right. that to flow again yeah a lot of the way that we're running our services and even our platform set up is inhibiting the move of the spirit mm -hmm. in the apostolic movement mm -hmm. and i'll explain it's because first of all when a person is in spiritual authority in the room they are in direct alignment with god helping to facilitate and govern that particular service. When I say govern, I don't mean like a tyrannical, but right. I mean just the navigation of what's going on, mm -hmm. the allowing of certain things to be released, mm -hmm. but the pulling back yes. of things that don't need to be yeah. released. Now, we have to understand spiritual authority to understand that. So if you're in Kerman, I have a chair that I sit in on the platform. Uh, at 9.30 every Sunday morning, I'm sitting in my chair. And so when the people walk in, I'm sitting in my chair and I'm praying at 9.30. It brings great comfort to those people when they walk in, mm -hmm. spiritual authority sitting in its seat today mm -hmm. and in the spirit. Yeah. Okay, so this is a literal way that I am now, I have, I have walked in and I have said, okay, I am in the, the directive seat of this right, service. Right, right. I'm, follow yeah. me as I follow Christ. Yeah, apostolic essence right. meets ritual. Right. So for 30 minutes I'm praying. This is why when we don't have pre-service prayer, we inhibit mm -hmm. some things. Right. Okay, because that at our church, that right there, me sitting in that chair. Yeah sets the tone for the whole day yeah. for there to be a liberty in the spirit. And I will sense and I will feel, and I'm sitting up there, I'm usually not praying in English, I'm praying in the Holy Ghost, and I'm praying in the Holy Ghost because I'm testing and sensing the flows that are in the atmosphere, and if something's off, I am literally correcting it with my anointed authoritative spirit that God has put on me as the spirit of leadership in that in that setting. Okay, so what I'm talking to you about today, a lot of ministry don't really comprehend this concept. And so they don't have pre-service prayer so that authority doesn't set the tone in that in that room. So when you get up there you got to you got to push for four songs mm -hmm, before mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. finally mm -hmm. just find halfway mm -hmm. a little bit of a vein. Mm -hmm. Okay? Number 2, another thing that we need to get corrected in the apostolic movement is apostolic authority needs to sit on the platform. Yes. And the reason why apostolic authority needs to sit on the platform is so that people can see that yes. apostolic authority and Absolutely. also so that that authority can see That's in the nice. room. Yeah. And so when I'm on the platform, I'm seeing literally, but I'm also seeing things in the spirit. Right. You see things, you sense things, you feel. It is the position where it, it is it is the watchman mm -hmm. that is looking to see what he will say mm -hmm. to the church. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get these little housekeeping things fixed, then it helps to align us to where we're where we're seeing apostolic flow in a service. 
So when a young man steps up to the pulpit, number one, he's not just up there in our pulpit because he's on the schedule. He's up there because I felt in the spirit to stick him in the pulpit for that particular service. I will never in my life have somebody in the pulpit just because we've got schedule and we're you know, doling it out equally, pulpit yeah. time. We don't do that. We're led by the Holy Ghost. And so that young man may have known he was preaching for two months. He may have known for two days. But he's in that pulpit because the Spirit has put him in that pulpit. I'm sitting in my chair, and I am with my spirit of ministry giving that young man release. And so when he's preaching, and we all know it when it uh, when it happens, but particularly the leader is going to be attuned to it when he kind of drifts out of the spirit and into his humanity a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it happens because mm-hmm. we're earthen vessels. Yeah. All of us yes. are in a little bit of humanity when we preach at yes. some point. Some guys are 80% humanity. Some guys have really prayed and fasted. They're only 20%. Mm-hmm. But when that young man drifts into his humanity a little bit, I'm sitting in my seat of apostolic authority, and I am exerting spiritual influence in there. I'm praying in the Spirit while he preaches. I will bump him with my spirit. Mm -hmm. And so I won't literally go pull his coattail, but he will feel in his spirit, ooh, I need to back off this, and I need to get back on the Word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I am literally teaching him to stay between the boundaries Mm -hmm. of what, Mm -hmm. as I'm sitting behind him on that platform— It all started in pre-service prayer. Yeah. He's not in the pulpit unless it's been a directive of the Spirit. Yeah. And I am guiding him with my anointing. And often, because he's in the Spirit, according to God, I already know what he's going to preach or something like that. And so this is what I'm talking about when I say that we need elders. Mm. We need Spirit-led elders who understand these things. And so organizationally, We've taken leaders off the platforms. We don't have pre-service preparation of prayer. We have people preaching just because it's a good idea, but it's not a God idea. And you can only get so much of these dynamics up there before you lock it up and just don't have a move of God. So if we can get these things in proper alignment, then what it does... Is that's what releases those service and releases those young Absolutely. people. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, one thing that we, we have a custom of doing here at CLC, and I think it's really great because it facilitates these kinds of this uh, apostolic atmospheres. Um, if we see, for example, Pastor Haney uh, <coughs> walk me. in during um, uh, a time where we're scheduled to MC uh, at a certain point in time, we make sure that we are aware of what he is feeling for service. If we have an additional task to do, we'll go to him, Pastor, on the schedule, it's this, you know, uh, we have this next, uh, however, whatever you feel, and he'll release or say, I'll take the mic, thank you, or go ahead and do that. Right. And it's a release and withholding. Right. And, and we actually have translated that in many ways into our uh, services on Wednesdays, for example, in the Lifeline where uh, a brother Morgan Ellis is the pastor, yeah. if I am an MC, if I'm the one who's going to run the service, right. I don't just usurp the mic and That's right. do things. That's right. I will go and I'll counsel with Absolutely. him, with Morgan, yeah. and I'll say, what do you feel? This is what I feel. Or he'll come to me, it's a, what it's are you a, feeling? It's submission communication. Exactly. And we, we, we are wrestling with what is the appropriate f- way forward to facilitate the apostolic move of God? Yeah. Is this a move of God that wants to take us into a takeover of the Spirit where nothing else happens except for the Holy Ghost moving? Or is the the potency of the Spirit in this atmosphere to take us as quickly as possible to yeah. the Word, to the yeah. preaching of the Word, yeah. counsel, and the interacting right. with each other's spirits is important it's, to it's find vital. the line. It's vital the because we we're not an, we're not an island to ourselves. Right. We function with an, one another. We're a body, and I would say that one of the things that I've noticed that I think that we maybe need to adjust in the apostolic movement is the way that we are conducting our altar services. Um, 
in some ways were using methods that were the will of God in a certain season and were trying to impose them into this season. And so many years ago, Brother Tim Green, who was a, he's a, he's a voice in my life, he taught me in my early 20s, ask God for a word of wisdom about the altar service. Mm-hmm. They won't all be the same. They'll be different. You may never have two alike. A lot of young guys fall into the trap of, oh, I got to get my closing down, or I've got to get my, ask God for a word of wisdom. Yes. Now, the general rule of thumb would be this, that unless God specifically tells you or directs you or prompts you to go back to the mic and to do something like, you know, get everybody together and do this or that or whatever, let it flow unless God tells you otherwise because you have you have released the word and now you want the spirit to just saturate that word into the spirits of those people and so the default setting should not be let's let's try to figure out what we can do to facilitate this the default setting should be to let it flow mm-hmm. and if there's some sort of inhibitor in the flow God will have you step up and say, hey, I, like, for example, last night, I yes, was trying to let right. it flow, but as I was praying for people, I was seeing that they couldn't get past their self issues. Mm-hmm. And so they weren't focusing on God, they were focusing on self. It happened with three or four people. Yeah. And so I said, you know what, guys, I'm going to stop this for a second and talk to you about not allowing your infirmity to become your identity. And I began to talk about some of those things that the Lord was prompting me on in the moment, but it wasn't because I was trying to work something up. Yeah, It was because in that flow, it's like there's a big tree branch in the middle and the water's flowing around it and we can get a partial flow, right. but I had to pull it out mm-hmm. of there. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes what we're doing is, especially I've seen in our conference settings, uh, is we're, we're just doing this all this stuff yeah. that, God didn't tell us to do all that stuff. He just wants to let that word flow into people. And so for a young minister, I would say, preach, let it flow. And if God tells you something, address it at that point. Yeah, and and, and, and this is is the, the, uh, the unfortunate part, is that many times those who are involved in the flow of the service from the beginning prayer to the end don't have the authority to overwrite those structures. Right. Uh, it would be inappropriate to overwrite them, even if you feel yeah. the potential of what would happen if we just yeah. did it, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, you're dealing with the potential that is sitting in the will of God, the potential will of God. And we have to resist pulling that down, because if we did it right. out of order, it wouldn't you be submit. right. You have to submit who will release us. Right. Yeah. And the elders. Okay. Who is granting the elders the ability to counsel Mm -hmm. with those that are taking the service from end to end? Yeah. We need that to recover that authority structure back, you know, where there is, let's say it, let's say it's a, you know, a, a, a local, uh, a a local, not a local, well, maybe a district youth leader, you know, maybe it's a, Mm -hmm. a, 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 who, who is sitting in that service and has the program but he knows God is doing something. So he looks for the elder. He He looks looks for for the the senior, uh, for someone who has an authority over, yes, and says, pastor, this is what I feel, or uh, brother, this is what I feel. And then this collaboration then facilitates the apostolic movement, even within these organizational services. Um, you know, it, it integrates the apostolic ministry back into yeah. these human structures. There was an age in Pentecost where they had a prophet on the platform in our major conferences. Oh, wow. wow. T.W. Barnes sat on the platform at Because of the Times Louisiana camp meeting his whole life. Mm. But a lot of this has shifted because of the move towards more performance. Mm-hmm. And so we're not just discovering all this. You mm-hmm. know, this is the deal about the fivefold ministry and gifts of spirit. This yeah. is nothing new. This yeah. is something that's always been there. It's just that it's got a layer of dust about that thick on it in yeah. some places, wow, and wow, we're wow. trying to brush it yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. And so what we really need to do is we need to recover an understanding of why we had an apostle or a prophet sitting on 
our platforms and it's for exactly what you talk yeah. what you said right there it's they're a touch point they're a north star they're a person who their full role mm-hmm. is to gauge the flow of the spirit and give the thumbs up or thumbs down and help to direct yeah and if we can get back to that yes. i think that we can start seeing what god wants to do be done at a more optimal yes uh way yeah. than what we're seeing in some of our settings in essence what we are seeing happen in landmark repeat mm-hmm. itself in yeah. it landmark has been for the past two years mm-hmm. we really saw it last year and this year more than any other time i have never seen such mutual submission to each other's ministries yeah than in landmark yeah cunningham gives it to pastor haney gives it to brother sanders gives it to brother Kleindienst, gives it to, uh, you know, uh, man, it's just passing and passing and passing. And each one is a build and a release and a release and a release and a release culminating in this apostolic atmosphere where these men of God are releasing each other right. and they're counseling amongst each other. As one is speaking, there's counsel. Oh man, I feel this. This reminds me of this event. This reminds me of that apostolic atmosphere there's a shade of what happened there here it gives us direction and and flow can we repeat that in other events in other yeah. places yes we can but we yeah. need the liberty amongst our elders yeah. and our yeah. leaders it to... needs to start in the local church yeah oh yeah, you know, absolutely in our local church our ministry team um you know on our platform those guys sit there with me and there are times when they'll lean over and say Pastor, this is what I'm feeling, and I'll send them to the pulpit. Right. You know, so right. we can have what happens at Landmark in the local church setting, and that's where it needs to repeat itself. Yes. Because if it's in the local church setting, that's where true. Right. That's where true. Well, multidimensional ministry is one of the most apostolic things that there possibly could be. I mean, multiple scenarios of First Corinthians 14. If there's a tongue that goes forward, let the elders gather together and let them discern. Right. And then. You know, you, you you see, obviously, Peter was the figurehead um, in a lot of the, aposto- you know, the first 10 chapters of the sermons that were preached. But if you read closely, it doesn't say, and Peter stood up and said, mm-hmm. and Peter stood up with the 11. With the 11. Or, and Peter and the 11 preached. Wow. Yes, yeah. Peter was the representation. He was yeah. the head. But it was multi dimensional ministry. Peter multi-dimensional. would say something, and then James would say something, right. and then John yeah would chime in. And you see this even in Jesus's ministry with the feeding of the 5,000. They're working their way through the multitude, right. talking to people, mm-hmm. trying to figure out what we can do in this scenario. Wow. Like you said, the counseling yes. among each other. Yes. And then they even come to Jesus. I think this is so interesting. And they counsel Jesus. It shows that there was that at least that type of openness. Obviously, you don't need to tell Jesus what to do, but there was that openness. Mm-hmm. The Lord they're hungry. We probably need to feed them if they're going to continue. And uh, the Lord obviously already had a plan, yeah. but there was just that openness in the midst of Jesus teaching and preaching. The disciples are working the crowd. They're walking through, trying to find food. They come to Jesus. Right. Hey, we've got loaves and fishes yeah. here. Even when Jesus preached, his ministry team was active in the service, yes. not just sitting there and yeah. And nodding and amening, wow. but backing up what he was, he was saying. He was secure yeah. enough to allow the others to have a voice. Right. Mm-hmm. And so this this idea, and we talk about systems and traditions, this idea that preaching is one person stands up, gives this excellent soliloquy or this right. monologue right. with with scriptures inserted. Homily. Yeah. Homiletics. Yeah. 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 Homily. That's br- where it comes from. Brings everybody. Rhetoric. Brings everybody uh, to an altar, and then we all pray, and then we all go home yeah. uh, without utilizing all the giftings that are in the room. Yeah, Obviously, excellent. the preacher for the service <laughs> is going to take the lead yeah. for the direction of that service. He's the one that's been praying and fasting. Yeah. Yeah. One of the most apostolic things you can do is, and and that's one thing I appreciate, and, and just to touch a little bit on what you were talking about earlier, having long services. I think we can be too cut and dry mm-hmm. with yeah. what it means to preach long. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes... Obviously, and that's why I love the wonderful liberty you're expressing to your young men, because if you create a broad, a broad stroke that you go over an hour, you know, that that's the cardinal sin. Well, if there's a guy up there and he's 
kind of just going on and on and on and on for an hour, that's probably out of order. Mm -hmm. He might preach for 30 minutes Mm -hmm. and he might flow for 35. Right. And that's a lot different than a guy that's reading what the commentary said for two hours. And so if you paint that broad, and that's the mantra of control. I, I, let me interject. I heard, I heard brother Cunningham say, I've seen every miracle in the new Testament except Eutychus. Yeah, and, and I enough. thought, well, there's a reason for that. It's because they all they've been all been told that 30 minutes is long enough for a good message, and it's it's right. uh, too long for a bad one. Right. right. Yeah, know, that's so really we've, good. We've boxed people in. Yeah, yeah. And, and and that's the mantra of control. That if you try to control the scenarios to eliminate all bad things, and I don't mean bad. There, there's parameters for that. You were talking about not putting a guy that's too green that he can't handle the mail a little bit. Well, there's scripture for that. It says, do not yeah. promote a novice. Right. There's scripture that says, don't put the guy up there. That's, yeah, right. that's not right. feeling. Right. That's not spiritual sensitivity. Right. That's word. Yeah. That that's you don't right. put a guy that just got saved mm-hmm. to lead a service, right? So he's got to have some type of semblance to put him up there. So we've got scriptural, hopefully scriptural barriers to protect us from the crazy, wacky things from happening. Yeah. But with people who we know are are in a learning stage, but have demonstrated godliness to a point where we can trust them. Well, if we try to control all the bad things from happening, we also limit the good things from happening yeah. because some of the best things that ever happen are going to happen in a two hour service. Absolutely. It's not going to happen in 30 minutes. Yeah. And last night we had a perfect demonstration of that. You yes. preached for a normal amount of time, but the service didn't end the for another hour. Yeah. And, and, and it wasn't just a silent altar call. Yeah. There was still direction going forward mm-hmm. and there was still, mm-hmm. here's the shift. Here's the shift. And we've painted, and I, I've I've noticed that about Landmark, our services, our day sessions were five hours yeah, long. Nobody yeah. even looks at the clock. I mm-hmm. never noticed the clock, and someone yeah. told me afterwards that our Wednesday day session stream was four hours and forty four minutes. Love it. Yeah, and that's there why were, I was so exhausted. I didn't realize. I was wondering why I was so tired. <laughs> well, there was carnal people that 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 really turned off. Mm, yeah, and I'm sitting the carnal there going, mind doesn't understand the things of this. And I haven't heard it a lot, only once. But yeah, but the idea is, do you not understand that your Christian denominationalism has pay, has so ingrained into you that long services are bad? Do you not know the day of your visitation? Don't yeah. you realize? Yeah. And, and they they what's hide going behind on. the guise of saying, "Well, if a new believer comes in and they're listening, they're gonna it, it, it's not going to relate to them." No, 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 no. You get someone who has felt the Holy Ghost for the first time in their life. <coughs> They've been transformed for the first time of their life. They're carrying their Bible wherever they go. They're starving. They're for putting it. oh God, they're, sermon after sermon after sermon. Where can I find more sermons? Where can I hear more songs? It is not the new believer that it bothers. That's right. It is the carnal mind, the carnal believer that it bothers because they cannot connect to what's going on in the spirit. A hungry sinner who says, I want more of this will say, I want, tell me another preacher. Awesome. Another song. Wow. I can just. Yeah. Take in and take in. It's truly the carnal mind that has a problem with that, not the spiritual mind. I, I believe that. that's what it is. I think we try to manufacture good soil among people mm-hmm. um, by creating such an environment that we're not trying to preach the word of God. We're just trying to get people to stay. Mm-hmm. And we limit. Jesus even tells us there's going to be four types of soil. Three of them are going to leave you. Yeah. But if you preach the true word of God, mm. you're going to get one that sticks around. I think we get so concerned with preaching to new people, we're actually becoming a market-driven church and not a spirit-led church. Because yeah. market-driven yeah. is only solely focused on progression of numbers. Yeah. And you read the, the, and this is another podcast for another time, but you read the scriptures, the, the, the New Testament church never had new people's services. Mm. You came to the church, they preached repentance. Mm-hmm. The way they reached it was in the streets was in Bible studies, was Paul reasoning with the people daily from the scriptures. Mm -hmm. True evangelists, right? But once they got into the church building, among the assembly, Mm -hmm. if you want to remain here, you have to repent. But we're not going to cater Mm -hmm. just so we can keep you in the building. Right, yeah. And I think... was for edification and perfection of what was in the building. Right. And so that they could go and do the work of ministry. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Most evangelism needs to take place out of this, out of the church building, Very not true. within oh, of it. Absolutely. Very true. Yeah. 
absolutely. Yeah, we've con- I think we've confused the uh, ministry of an evangelism with the spiritual gift of exhortation. Very good. Uh, mm-hmm. Exhortation is not encouraging, or no, not, uh, exhortation is not correcting. That's how. That's a cultural understanding of that word. That word in Romans when it says, you build know, up. it's it means build up. It means motivate to do to act, uh, yeah. and that is the gift of exhortation. You know, uh, yeah. and things. So we have to set things in the right order. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you see itinerant ministry in the scripture. Largely, it's apostle and prophet. Mm-hmm. It's very little uh, of what we would see scripturally as evangelist. Mm. We do know that Philip, the evangelist, did do some traveling, but he's he's called an evangelist when he's in Caesarea, basing out of his house. And so there's a local centric touch there that's connected with that. And then we see evangelist in concept in Ephesians four. And then we see the work of the evangelist being done or couched in the ministry of the pastor. But itinerant ministry largely in Scripture is the prophets in a circuit, and it's the apostles on missionary journeys and going into cities and Mm -hmm. things of that Mm -hmm. nature. And so what we're going to see happen in Pentecost is there's always going to be room for our traveling exhortation type people because there are churches that want that and worship that if you will and mm-hmm. i don't mean that as in a derogatory way it's just yeah. the reality of the terrain of modern pentecost but for the apostolic church there's going to be a return to book of acts and structure function mm-hmm. flow demonstration yeah and it's going to require that an evangelist become a true evangelist and it's going to require that itinerant ministries become what God intended them to be. And so a lot of what we call evangelists who are traveling were called by God to travel, Mm -hmm. but they're not evangelists. They're called to be traveling prophetic voices. Very true. And so what's happening is I see that some guys are are being starved off the field, if you will. That's Mm. the common terminology because they're not willing to move beyond the exhortation gifting and tap into the prophetic. Wow. And then some guys are growing while on the field, and they're moving into their prophetic gifting. And so I believe that we're going to see a full reworking and realignment of yeah. itinerant travel yeah. ministry. The breakdown of that word evangelist is so incredible when you really understand. If you think of the word, a word that ends with ist mm-hmm. is a specialist. You think of an optometrist. Mm. You think of a dermatologist. Mm-hmm. The word evangelist literally means, it comes from the Greek word gospel. It's the word we get gospel. Right. Mm-hmm. He's a gospelist. Mm-hmm. He's a bringer of the gospel. Yeah. That's right. He's a specialist yes. at bringing the gospel yes. mm-hmm. and seeing people saved and transformed. Right. It's not a person that travels and preaches their best messages yes. and, right. Right. and ha- has a has an itinerary of 20 sermons right. that they go through and it's a great it's clap cool. and entertainment. It's wow. someone who specializes right. in taking the Maybe gospel so. to areas that it's untapped wow. and yeah. to present. And that's Philip demonstrated in, wow. in He teaches in and eight. preaches the death, burial, and resurrection. That's it. And, and, and he and opened a new territory. And our obedience to it. And he teaches others how to do the same. And people don't realize that that ministry, how powerful that ministry was. Mm-hmm. Up until that time, the gospel, five yeah. years in, had not left Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Brother Merrill Cornwell is an evangelist. Right. So he has traveled all over the country, but the reason why he's traveling, and he does have a prophetic touch on his ministry as well, but the reason why he's traveling is at home he's teaching and preaching the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection, and he's teaching and preaching the obedience to the gospel in home Bible studies. And when he's traveling, he's teaching and preaching others how to do exactly what he does at home. Mm. And so that's an evangelist. That's what an evangelist looks like. Right. Very good. Yeah. I think we've uh we've covered a lot of things. Is there anything else that you guys are burdened to say before we uh kind of come off the podcast here? Schedule part two. Schedule part two. <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly so. like we barely just yeah, started tapping in. So. Uh, no, I wanna I, I wanna can. give a I wanna give a message recommendation. Mm. Um Brother Mark Morgan preached a great message that came to my mind the other day, right before he was stepping up to preach. I actually mentioned it to him. I wasn't trying to influence the man of God, but if he wanted to preach it again, I'd be okay with it. Um, He preached a message called Equality, and he preached it at Because of the Times, probably early 90s. 
And that message was a message that opened the eyes of primarily the organization and any of the apostolic movement which was affected by because of the times in that season to the equality or the mutual responsibility of apostolic ministry among the fivefold. Yeah. And he talks about, <clears throat> um, like what I said last night, it's not about rank, it's about role. And it, it, he talks about the roles and the equality of all five needed um, in the body. And that's an important perspective and concept yes. that we're needing to get a hold of right now is move beyond this rank system mm. and move into everybody fulfilling their proper role in the body. Amen. Very important. I'm going to make sure to include that link in, uh, in our, uh, our page so that people can have direct yeah. access to it. You said because of the times? Yeah, it, it's it's on YouTube somewhere, okay. probably. I'll, I'll maybe even put it in the description. He preached of that this message yeah, in I'll Houston yeah. uh, at Life Tabernacle for Brother Kilgore. Okay. And Brother Kilgore heard it and called Brother Mangan and asked if he would have him come preach that thought if yeah. he felt it would be the will of God at because of the times. And I remember listening to that as a as a young preacher, and it it really ministered to me because it painted some things in in a formative yeah. season of life to wow. where I desired to move beyond kind of a pastor centric paradigm and move into the fullness of apostolic ministry. And I think that we can be, we need to be radical about team ministry. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I got off the phone right before the podcast tonight, I'm preaching a bilingual service and uh, brother Andre Gomez is translating for me. And so We've been preparing for this. I found out yesterday morning. So I had him preach at home last night, and I preached here because we want to be tapped in and in the flow when we get in the pulpit tonight together. So by him wow. preaching in the home pulpit, he's getting in that flow. Yeah. So this morning we spoke on the phone, and I said, this is what I sense and feel is the flow. This is where I'm going. And while I was speaking to him, the Lord gave him a scripture. He's the translator. He's not the guy that's yeah. asked to preach, but yeah. what's going to happen— God gave him the scripture, and immediately, I know this, it's in the Holy Ghost. We're in alignment. I'll yeah. probably preach from that as my text tonight. Yeah. Wow. So it's team ministry. Yes. Not only that, if they give me an honorarium tonight, I'm going to give him half of it because I truly believe in the equality of team ministry. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah. so we have to get to that place where we're not just saying that we want team ministry, but we truly yeah. believe in the role of our brother. Yeah. And when we l believe in the role of our brother, it releases us in the role that God has wow. put us in. Man, so many, so many treasures that you just dropped mm. right now. You know, uh, apart from that dynamic that you are participating in <laughs> with Brother Gomez, uh, which is absolutely on point. I mean, I've been in multiple situations where there's a translator, and when you get into a flow is when the translator aligns his spirit with the preacher and they become one and the same. They, yeah. uh, the translator adopts the anointing and the spirit of right. the preacher, the speaker. And also you mentioned the detail uh, about Brother Kilgore that has yeah. to do with mutual ministry. What, gives, what gave Brother Kilgore the right to be able to call Brother Megan? in a conference that is not necessarily his, yeah. and say, would you be willing to have this? You know, that is incredible in itself. That means that Brother Kilgore, he has a position as an elder to freely be able to pick up the phone and say, consider this. Not, you know, necessarily, you have to do this. Yeah. And, and, and that humility is necessary, even though as an elder, certainly he has the authority to be able to do that, yeah. you know? which is the mark of someone who really understands authority is not, you take authority with humility. You don't say, I'm going right, to do right. this. You say, yeah. would you consider, you right. know? And that consider is really, I right. feel it from the Lord that this should be what it is, yeah. uh, but I'm offering humility to you. But that is the mutual thing that we're talking about. Yeah. Like you said, and I think it fell right. I felt the witness of the spirit in the way that you described it. It's not that we've never practiced such things. Yeah. It's that dust has collected right. on this apostolic way of doing ministry, mm -hmm. and we got to shake the dust off yeah. to allow apostolic ministry to come back to the forefront of the church 
end times are here. We're accelerating to the end. Now is the time. Yeah. Now is the time. Now is the time. That's the word. Amen. Well, before we go, um, I don't usually do this. We usually just conclude and leave. Uh, you know, uh, would you guys mind praying that God would just anoint this podcast, particular podcast session, uh, to really yeah. impact the church? I really want to do that. I really yeah. want to do that. Let's pray, Lord. Amen. Thank Father, you, I thank Jesus. you for the for opportunity all that you have done, together, Lord God. together, talk thank about you the your your Thank you for your word. Thank you for your.